Hi everyone. Let's talk a little bit more about organic chemistry and specifically about naming alkenes, alkenes, carbon-carbon double bonds. So we're in Key Concepts Unit 2, Part 1. In a previous video, we talked about classifying reactions. So go to those key concepts and scroll down until you see naming alkenes. Okay, let's talk about some common names. There's four that you need to be aware of. You need to know, <laughs> memorize. So first one here is the simplest alkene. That's a carbon carbon double bond attached to only hydrogens. The common name is ethylene. I'll give you the IUPAC name in a minute. But um, yeah, you see that around somewhere, ethylene. That's a common name for the simplest alkene. And then if you add one more carbon, the common name for that is propylene. Yeah, three carbons is propane. But the mean, but propyl mean, yeah, there's a common name. So we're not going to see that too often, but they pop up here and there. So um, you can make plastics out of these. So there's polyethylene. That's um, most plastics, like um, plastic uh, grocery bags. Polypropylene in biology, they use those microcentrifuge tubes made of plastic. That's polypropylene. Another common name, vinyl chloride. Well, yeah, there's a third type of plastic, polyvinyl chloride, or abbreviated PVC, polyvinyl chloride. And so this molecule, there's a sculptor drawing of vinyl chloride and a full structural drawing of vinyl chloride. Yeah, you can take that molecule and make a plastic out of it. It's water resistant, waterproof, great for plumbing. There's another molecule, Allyl chloride. So it's kind of following the same pattern here in a sense. Two carbons is vinyl, three carbons is allyl. You know, that's just weird. The key thing to remember about the allyl group is that allyl has three L's in it. So there's three carbons in the same molecule. Nice little way to remember allyl is three carbons. Put the extra group on the sp3 hybridized carbon. Or in other words, don't put the extra group on the double bond itself. It goes on the carbon that's not double bonded. So this is allyl chloride. This would be allyl alcohol, right? So the carbon that's not double bonded gets the extra group. Nice, okay, so I know, commit those to memory. They're not that common, but they pop up here and there. And here's a case of where it could pop up Suppose on the test, I say, hey, why don't you draw for me vinyl cyclohexane? That's a common name, but you still break it down and be able to draw it. Well, cyclohexane is a ring, cyclo is a ring of how many is hexane? <laughs> six. So six carbons in a ring is cyclohexane. And then it doesn't say where to put the vinyl group. Well, it can go anywhere. It's not an IUPAC name. Um, if it was an IUPAC name, you might expect a number, but it turns out wherever you put it on the ring, that becomes carbon one. So what are we attaching to the ring? What is vinyl? It's a C double bond C group with all H's except for one, the point of attachment. So maybe I'll just attach it here and draw it as a skeletal drawing. That's vinyl cyclohexane. Right, so the vinyl group is two double, two carbons double bonded with hydrogens except for an extra group, and that's how you name it. It's vinyl, then the extra group. Okay, we're done with the common names. Let's explore IUPAC names, a standardized way of naming alkenes. <clears throat> okay, key things here, key concepts, right? So. We really do need to memorize the procedure. So go refer back to the naming handout we had in a previous video. I cut and pasted part of it here. Um, so back when we had the name alkanes and <clears throat> molecules containing halogens, well, don't forget the, the procedure there because you're gonna keep using that same procedure. We're just gonna add in new, more functional groups. Okay, so step one of naming organic molecules is identify the longest chain or ring 
that contains the highest priority functional group. In our previous video, we talked about naming alkanes and halides. And it turns out alkanes are ranked higher, higher priority than halides. So when we had to name a molecule, the most important functional group, highest priority functional group, was the alkane. So we kind of ignored that fact that we're trying to find the parent with the highest priority group. And we just said, well, let's just find the longest chain of ring. Well, today we're adding the alkene functional group, and alkenes are higher ranked than alkanes. So IUPAC says you must find the parent with the most important functional group. That means find out where the dull bond is, the alkene, and that is forced to be on the parent. The parent must have the most important functional group, regardless of the chain length. Yeah, we'll do a couple examples to emphasize that point. And then when it's time in step two, step two naming, let's zoom back over there. Here it is. Step two is choose the parent name and the suffix. Okay, so before with the alkanes, we just had the name, you know, Molly eats peanut butter, methane, ethane, propane, butane, and then pentane, hexane, so forth. And those names came with the ane suffix because they're alkanes. Well, now we're going to tweak the suffix and then alkene, carbon carbon double bond. So here's a chain of four, four carbons here. Four carbons is butter, you know, Molly eats peanut butter. Butter reminds you of butane. But now the name is butene because the most important group is not the ane, alkane, it's alkene, the carbon carbon double bond. So step two, um, find the longest chain with the most important functional group and then name it. So in this example here, four carbons, butane, but it has a alkene, so it's butene. Step three, the next bullet point, but let's zoom over here to the uh, procedure. Step three is the number of the chain, sorry, number of the carbons of the chain or ring in order to give the lowest number to the highest priority functional group. So the highest priority functional group needs to get the lowest number. And then if it's tied, then you start looking at branches. Okay, so then for this example, we got a chain of four and we don't start numbering at this end, we wanna start numbering closest to the double bond right here. So there's carbon one, because our double bond, the most important group, it's gotta be at the end, at the closest, you know, at closest to the end to get the lowest number. Okay, and then that's it. I guess the other detail is we know, we're supposed to know, we're supposed to know our functional groups, so we know when we have an alkene, the ene ending, that means carbon carbon double bond, two carbons. And they're adjacent, right? That's how you make an alkene. Adjacent carbons are double bonded. So to indicate where the double bond is in your chain, you only have to indicate the first numbered carbon of that alkene. So right here, carbon one begins the double bond. So of course, number two must end the double bond. So in the name, you don't need the two. It's just understood. It's understood that the second alkene carbon immediately follows afterwards. So that's how you construct the name of this molecule. Real quickly, step one, longest chain with the most important functional group. It's a chain of four. Step two, name it. Four carbons was butane, but this is an alkene, so it's butene. Step three, number that chain to get the lowest number on the highest priority group. So the left side on the alkene is where we start numbering. And then the last detail, um, you can stick the one out in front but the one is talking about the ene group. Where is the alkene? It starts on carbon one. So there's two ways you can do it. The older way is putting the one out in front of the whole parent name. The latest recommendation by IUPAC is to keep the number with the suffix so it's understood exactly what that number is re referring to. The one is telling you about the ene. The ene, the carbon carbon double bond, begins on carbon one. So, but there's still IUPAC accepted. So you decide how you want to write your names out. 
Do you want to put the one in front of the parent or do you want to put the one in front of the suffix? If you don't care, I would recommend putting it in front of the suffix. That's the clearest way to see what the one's talking about. The one's referring to the position of the double bond. Okay, last little bit of, of detail about carbon carbon double bonds is that it's possible to have cis and trans isomers. So we saw that a little bit of that in unit two. Um, later in this video, we'll go into more detail about it, but really quickly, we're just talking about, here's a carbon carbon double bond. Draw a line through it and decide where are the two identical groups. Is that here you can talk about, hey, this double bond, carbon carbon double bond has two H's. The H's are identical to each other. So where are the H's? On the same side, two S's, same side, cis. Oh wait, we spell cis like this. That's a little clever little mnemonic to help us remember. You can also say, hey, the methyls are identical to each other and they're also above the dull bond, same side, they're cis. Either way, this is a cis isomer. Identical groups on the same side of the dull bond. Okay, I think we have all the details for naming alkenes. Let's give it a go. Start over here on the right. Hey, that's vinyl cyclohexane. Yeah, that was a common name. Let's assign a standardized name, an IUPAC name. Okay, step one, find the longest chain of ring with the most important functional group. Who's more important? The double bond or, al or single bonds? Alkenes are more important. So automatically, the chain wins. The chain is the parent, the ring is not. And you can't say, oh wait, how about if I just make this chain go all the way around? No, no, no. Ring carbons cannot be chain carbons. So this carbon's part of the ring, not part of the chain. So I found the, the parent, it's the chain or ring with the most important functional group. It's two carbons long. So let's name it. Let's see, Molly eats peanut butter. Eats is ethane. The parent name is going to be ethane. Wait, ane ending? No, we change it to the ane ending because it's an alkene. That's the most important functional group here. Step three is a number of the chain to get closest to the first branch or functional group. Well, functional group, most, <laughs> that's the most important one. Um, so we're going to start numbering this one and then this one too. Or we could have numbered the double bond at the end here and say, hey, this is carbon one, then two. It's a tie either way. The double bond gets the lowest number, so that's good. But if you have a tie, break the tie with the first branch. And that's where the ring connects. So it's better to put one here so that both the double bond, carbon carbon double bond, shows up on carbon one. And the extra group also shows up on carbon one, the cyclohexane group. But wait, cyclohexane? That's not the name of this group. Ane ending, that suffix is a parent name. Just like methane is a parent name. If you have a, a, an extra CH3 group, that's not a methane group. That's a methyl group. So this isn't a cyclohexane group. It's a cyclohexyl group. And it's on carbon one. So we named the extra group and we located it. The cyclohexyl groups on carbon one. The, the alkene, carbon carbon double bond is also on number one. So the full name is one cyclohexyl, one ethene. Now you see why a lot of people just want to call it vinyl cyclohexane. Nice, quick, common name. A little less cumbersome than the IUPAC standardized name. All right, let's try the next one. Down here, we got just a little bunch of carbons. Step one is find the longest chain with the most important functional group. So here's the longest chain. Those are our little alarms going off, little red flag waving, say, no, don't do that. Yeah, because where's the most important functional group? Right here. Hey, this carbon didn't get placed on the parent. It has to. IUPAC says, no, most important functional group's got to be on the parent. I know that's the longest chain. Sorry, but the committee vote at IUPAC said, parent has got to have the most important functional group. So that's not the parent, what I circled there. You must include. 
the alkene, the carbon-carbon double bond. So our choices are, you can go across the top. So start with the alkene, because it has to be on the parent. Got both carbons of the alkene. Or you could say, well, I got both carbons of the alkene, and I can go down here. Which one's correct? The longer of the two. So you do want the longest chain, but it must contain the parent, sorry, must contain the most important functional group. That was step one. Step two says to name it. Okay, the parent chain has five carbons. The pentagon has five walls, right? Pentane is the parent, is the parent name here, but change the suffix to ene. So it's pentane becomes pentene. Yeah, just like the shampoo. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> and now number those five carbons so you get to the most important function group as fast as you can. Now this is not always going to happen, but twice now the double bond began the chain. Doesn't have to begin the chain, but it does here. So definitely call the you know this end number one to get to that double bond as fast as you can. And that's how you number the parent. And now go down the parent chain, find the extra branches and the extra groups and name those. On carbon two, there's this two carbon group, that's an ethyl group. And then don't forget to indicate the location of the ene. Yeah, I almost did. One pentene. Cool. You know what I haven't been doing? got to get in the habit of doing, is checking for cis and trans isomers. So we're going to discuss that in more detail in a few minutes. For now, let me just say there are no cis trans isomers here. The one cyclohexyl, one ethene did not have a cis or trans isomer. So these are complete names. You don't put in cis, you don't put in trans. They're, they don't have isomers that are cis and trans. More on cis and trans in a little bit. Just trying to get the uh, the other names going here, right? Find the longest chain with the most important functional group. I know, IUPAC is a committee vote. They don't want to call the horizontal chain the parent, because if you do, you don't get the alkenes. And they said, alkenes, higher rank than alkanes. So you gotta get this double bond and the other double bond on the parent. So the only way to do that is to call this set of carbons the parent chain. So that was step one. We found the parents, got the most important functional groups. I know there's two alkenes, get them both. Step two, name the parent. All right, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. Seven, the event was seven. The events in the Olympics, the women's do is the heptathlon. Heptane is the parent name. Let's see, let's put it down here. But wait, before I write ane, it's going to be ene. But there's two of them. Let's um, let's do something else. So many of you probably can already do it, but not everyone. So let's take a step-by-step -step approach. Step one is to name the parent. The parent is seven carbons, heptane. And then we change the suffix to ene. That's not the complete parent name, but it's good enough for now. We'll fix it in a minute. Seven carbons with the ene functional group. I know there's two of them. We'll get to that in a second. All right, step three, number the chain. Okay, it's a chain, so either this end or that end is carbon one. Try and get to a functional group as fast as you can. Well, that means this end's gotta be carbon one because you can immediately get a whole one, lowest golf score, if you start numbering from this end. You're right on the alkene. And yeah, yet again, the alkene is starting the chain. That's not always gonna happen, but it happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, you'll see some more problems. Well, that will not be the case. The double bond will be within the chain. All right, I numbered it. Seven carbons, we're done. Done with step three. Step four is a walk down the chain and name and number all the extra groups, all the extra decorations. So to be technical, this double bond is special. It needs to be recognized. There is, so the parent name, heptene, but I'm gonna redo it here. 
On carbon one begins a double bond, the ene group. On carbon two, the ends a double bond, but we don't put the two in there. On number three is this group, four carbons long butter butane. It's a butyl group coming off of carbon three. On four is this group. Hey, that's another four carbon group. On carbon four, there's a butyl group. Walk up to five. On five begins another double bond, another ene group. So on five, there's an ene. And on six, it ends the ene, double bond group. Don't put six. That's my Pax decision. And then the last carbon seven doesn't have any decorations. Okay, so you remember when you have two butyls or two chloros, you say dichloro. So we're supposed to combine these two and say it's a three, four dibutyl group, groups. You do the same thing with the suffixes. Yep, you have two enes, so that's a one, five diene. Oh man, I'm dying here. Had to say it. Okay. The ene goes at the end. So now we can construct the parent. So it's hept diene. Hept diene, hept diene. That doesn't slide off the tongue. IUPAC says, yeah, why don't you keep the A in there? Heptadiene. Okay, if you forget the letter A, I'm not going to take points off for spelling errors. So if you say hept diene for the parent name, full credit. But if you look it up, it's going to be heptadiene. Put the one five in front, or your choice, you could put the one five next to the suffix. So I got the parent name with the numbers for the alkenes. I have to stick the prefix in front, three, four dibutyl. Or three, four dibutyl. I can leave myself enough room, squeeze it on in there. There we go. So 3,4-dibutyl, 1,5-heptadiene, or 3,4-dibutyl, hepta, 1,5-diene. Both are acceptable IUPAC names. Am I done? I left it at the top of the screen to remind me. Nope, check for cis and trans. So we'll do that in more detail in a minute. Turns out the alkene at carbon 1 does not have cis-trans isomers, but the carbon, I'm sorry, the double bond at 5 does. This turns out to be the trans. Where are the identical groups on the alkene carbons? Well, in carbon six, there's a methyl. In carbon five, there's this crazy group. They're not identical. Yeah, but what else is there? On carbon six is a hydrogen. On carbon five is another hydrogen. Why didn't I just put the hydrogen this way? Um, because that carbon's sp2 hybridized. Sp2 means bond angles of 160. No, 120, sorry. Yeah, bond angles are 120. Um, and so it makes more sense for the hydrogen to stick out here so that this has a triangular shape, trigonal shape, trigonal planar, sp2, and put the hydrogen this way. Then, how's the double bond going? It's The double bond goes this way. So put a line through the double bond and see the identical groups are on opposite sides. That is the trans isomer. There we go. Now we're done with that molecule. Crazy name for a crazy looking molecule. All right, last one. I wrote it four times. You don't have to do it four times. But I thought in this video, I'd just demonstrate all the possible ways of numbering this. And then we have to narrow down to one correct IUPAC accepted way to number that molecule. All right, but that's step three. I'm getting ahead of myself. Step one, find the longest chain of ring with the most important functional group. All right, well, the ring has the alkene in it, so that wins. Don't even have to count. Where's the most important functional group? So bond wins, so here's the parent. The parent has six carbons in a ring. That's cyclohexane, ooh, that's cyclohexene. Hexane becomes hexene. Cool, that's step two, we got the parent. Step three, okay, that's why I drew it three times, sorry, four times. 
because to be completely mechanically minded, just like stepwise mechanical robotic in a sense, the rules say start numbering the ring so that you can get to the most important function group as fast as you can. So this carbon could be number one, or this carbon could be number one. It's a tie. So which one should we do? Well, instead of going through the whole procedure and not trying to narrow it down, I would I thought maybe I'll just show you all possible combinations, and then we can pick out the best one by IUPAC's definition of best. Yeah, that sometimes it doesn't make any sense. But these are the rules we have to live by. Okay, so one way is, okay, we're starting on the alkene. We could have gone clockwise. Maybe someone's alarm is going off, low red flag. Or you could have started here and gone counterclockwise. The other possibility is start over here on the left side with one and go clockwise. Or you could have gone counterclockwise. Anyone's alarm going off? Anyone sensing that doesn't feel right? Okay, technically, those are four possible ways. IUPAC saw you can't have four ways of doing it. We need one correct way. So the first thing is the low red flag going off, the alarm going off. Carbon one starts the double bond, carbon two finishes it. That's bad numbering. You can't have one, the double bond start on one and end on six. No, nope. IUPAC said, right, it's assumed, it's understood that the second alkene carbon will follow immediately afterwards. So if the double bond begins on one, it has to end on two. Okay, so this one's out too. We got the alkene on carbons one and six. So nope, can't do it that way. So really, there's only two ways of doing it two possible ways. We could start the double bond at the top of the ring and go to the left counterclockwise so we finish on two. Or we could have started here and gone clockwise and finish the double bond on two. They're tied. IAPAC then says, okay, if they're tied, break the tie at the first branch. So for this numbering scheme on the left here, we don't get to a branch till we hit number five. But if you number this way, you hit a branch at number three. So this one's the correct way. Okay, so then the whole procedure should be the ring is the parent. The name of the ring is cyclohexene. Start numbering at the most important function group. Okay, so is this carbon one or is this carbon one? Well, if this is one, then this is two. And then, hey, three is a branch. The other possibility is, well, this could have been one, then two, and then three is not a branch, four is not a branch, five, that's waiting too long. This is the correct way. One, then two, then three, four, five, six. Nice. Okay, the parent name is cyclohexene. So walk down the ring, see what else is there. Well, the alkene is on carbon one. Carbon three is a two carbon group, that's eats or ethyl. Carbon four is a methyl branch. Did I do that right? No, three is ethyl, sorry. Come on, brain, keep up. Come on, hand. Three. Let's construct the name, alphabetical order. E before M for my prefixes. So three ethyl, four methyl. The ene goes at the end of cyclohex and you can keep the one next to it or not, your choice. Oh, my choice? Okay, then I'm gonna pick, leave it with the, the suffix. And then we gotta remember double bonds, check for cis and trans. Okay, to be technical, those two hydrogens are on the same side. It's actually cis. If you put cis here, I will give you full credit on exams. Turns out though, cis doesn't exist. Sorry, trans doesn't exist for cyclohexane, cyclohexene. So 
if you try and put in a trans double bond, right? So get the hydrogens, the identical groups on other sides, and now make these four carbons into a six carbon ring. So maybe I'll put a carbon here, right? About the same distance. I'll put a carbon here. And then now somehow, ee, ee, no, it doesn't, you can't reach. There's no way to close the ring of these six carbons if the double bond's in the trans orientation. Trans is impossible unless you have a ring of eight atoms or more. So that's later in our key concepts. We'll review that. Just want to say, hey, if you look up the structure of this molecule, this is the IUPAC name you're going to see. The cis is optional because trans does not exist. So it must be cis. And you discover that as you start to draw it. Cyclohexene, wait, six in a ring? I can't do anything other than cis. Let's talk a little bit more about cis and trans now. Whoops, I go too far. Where is it? Keep going. It's all the way over here. Okay. Got a nice little picture here. Oh, right. So on Canvas, this is actually going to start Key Concept Unit 2, Part 2. Oh, please. <laughs> so while I'm trying to orient the screen, go grab Key Concept Part 2. We're going to get started on that now. Yeah, it's all about cis and trans isomers. They're also called geometric isomers. The geometry are different. I don't know why. Geometric isomers refers to cis and trans isomers. And that's something we're going to need to do. We, know we need to be able to watch for that and be able to name them. Um, they only happen in alkenes, carbon-carbon double bonds, and in cyclic alkenes. So a ring with the alkenes. So those are only two cases. It's kind of nice. So why do you have why do you have cis and trans with alkenes? Well, remember the carbon carbon double bond consists of a pi bond and a sigma bond. So in this representation, maybe this line is your sigma. But what is a pi bond? That's when one p orbital, the little figure eight dance of the electrons, three dimensional figure eight, a dumbbell shape, whatever is overlapping with the other p orbital. So there's one electron in this orbital, one electron in this one. It could have been down here, that dot. The electron can go anywhere in this region. But the pi bond's created when these two p orbitals overlap. And the electrons are free to go anywhere above or below in, this, in these p orbitals. That's the pi bond. If, however, while you, after you made the pi bond, if you had enough strength or the ability to crank on this molecule and twist the p orbital, that is rotate the molecule, this lobe would no longer overlap with this lobe. If they can't overlap, they can't bond. So a rotation would actually break the pi bond. Okay, that takes energy to break a bond. So that's not gonna happen if you have a carbon-carbon double bond unless you have a tremendous amount of energy. So regular temperatures, regular energies, once you make the double bond, it's locked in place. And if you decide to put a hydrogen on this side and a hydrogen on that side, those two hydrogens are stuck on this side of the double bond. They are cis now. That's it, they're stuck there. If you have a single bond, right? So if we say, hey, what about these methyls? They're on the same side of this bond. Then that looks cis to you? Well, yeah, kind of, but you know what? You can spin this group. That's a single bond. Single bonds are free to spin. So you just spin butane. Yeah, this molecule is butane. You can spin it so the methyl group now appears on the other side, and then you can spin it back. And if you're just spinning the same molecule, you're creating different shapes of the same thing. These are not different isomers. They're different shapes of the same molecule. In fact, the shapes or conformations actually have names. Eclipse for this one and anti. For that one, anti is also a special stagger conformation. But you can't just spin this end because of the pi bond. So like I said before, once you get the identical groups positioned, they're stuck, locked in place. So the two identical groups, you might say, oh, the methyls are the identical groups. Yeah, the methyls are identical here too, but single bond is free to spin. They're not locked in place. No cis-trans for butane. 
butene, the alkene, however, they can't rotate. So you do get a cis isomer where the identical methyls are on the same side, or you can also create the transbutene so the identical groups are opposite. And I just arbitrarily picked the methyls. You could also pick the hydrogens as your identical groups. They're also on opposite sides. That works too. Oh, there's a little blurb about chair conformations. We should just quickly review that, right? So I'm just gonna draw a skeletal drawing. And if I put two groups, maybe the chlorines, it's just, well, let's make them methyls. Why change? You got a whole bunch of methyls all over the place. If one methyl's on a wedge, the other methyl's on a dash, this methyl's above the ring, this methyl's below, it's on opposite sides of the ring. And there's no way to rotate the single bond. Wait, if that single bond's could rotate, yeah, but to rotate this all the way around, this ring would have to like break to allow this group to spin. The ring stops the rotation. It's not frozen in place, right? They can do their wiggle, they do their chair dance, the little chair flip. But as it wiggles in between one chair and the other, these methyls will always be on opposite sides of the chair. They'll always be trans. They are locked onto opposite sides. So cyclohexanes, cycloalkanes, I should say, rings <laughs> with alkanes can have cis and trans. And then alkenes, carbon carbon double bonds, can also have cis and trans. And then I jumped the gun. Here's my little footnote about saying that a trans alkene double bond, trans, can exist, cannot exist in a ring with seven or fewer carbons. You need eight to be able to get a double bond in the trans configuration, right? So there's four carbons already. And here's five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So now there's enough room to get the trans double bond into a ring. You need eight in order to do it. And then if you have more, then the ring's even floppier, more you know, twistable, malleable, wiggleable. You can get it in there. Okay, let's practice cis and trans a little bit. Kind of already did this. Remember cis, remember same side, cis. Sounds like two S's. Nice. All right, so let's try it out. Here's a sample problem. This could be on the test. Give you the structure and ask you to identify it as cis, trans, or maybe it's not cis or trans. So what I would do is I would draw my dotted line through the, the alkene and find two identical groups on the alkene carbons. So hey, alkene carbon, what do you have? Well, one has a methyl, one has a hydrogen. The other alkene carbon has an ethyl and a hydrogen. Ooh, hydrogen, there's a hydrogen on each of the alkene carbons. And they're on the same side. The hydrogens are identical, they're on the same side. This is the cis isomer. Nice, okay, try this one. The line through the bond, here's one alkene carbon, there's an H and an H. Ooh, those are identical, they're on opposite sides. No, 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 that's not how the game's played. <laughs> Foul, <laughs> penalty flag. Okay, you have to find an identical group on each alkene carbon. Okay, so this alkene carbon has H's, this alkene carbon has an H and an ethyl. So here is an H, and now you get the pick. You wanna talk about this hydrogen or that hydrogen? Well, if you pick this one, it looks cis. If you pick that one, they look trans. Which one is it? Yeah, it's neither. This is neither cis nor trans. So you're looking at the identical group of each alkene carbon. All right, let's try this one. Uh, throw a line through the double bond. This alkene carbon has a methyl and a hydrogen. This alkene carbon has an ethyl and a chlorine. Yeah, that's four different groups. Four different groups? That sounds like a chiral carbon. Wait, wait, no, this is two carbons, not chiral. Never mind. It's neither. Actually, it's a big question mark. Let's do another test. Do another sample problem. So I'm not saying what this is just yet. Let's explore a little bit more. 
And by exploring it, meaning, hey, if this is cis, give me the other one, the other geometric isomer, draw for me trans. If this is cis, then trans must be possible. I don't know if it must be possible, but let's try and draw it. Well, in order to do that, let's get the identical groups on opposite sides. So bad idea here. What if we say, well, I'm just going to copy the ethyl and the methyl, and I'll leave this hydrogen down here, and then I'll put this hydrogen up here. Yay, identical groups on opposite sides. Don't do this. I hate this. You can't put everything above the ring. It's like, that's not how the molecule looks like. Wait, what's the shape of this carbon? Well, what's the hybridization? It's sp2. It's flat trigonal. So it needs to be triangle shaped. The bond angles need to be 160, 120, 120. So this is a bad drawing. No, switch your groups. So if you want to leave the, don't leave that though. If you want to leave the methyl and the hydrogen alone, that's fine. But go back up here. The ethyl and the hydrogen needs to trade places. So put the ethyl down here. Good, it's nice and sp2, trigonal planar. And now more clearly, the, the identical groups are on opposite sides. This one is trans. I'm not gonna give you credit for this over here. You just, no, that's not, no. The molecule is not drawn correctly. Bond angle's way off. Cool, all right. Do the same thing with this one that I really messed up. <laughs> oh my goodness. I would pick this hydrogen, this hydrogen. So for one carbon, switch its two hydrogens. Wait, that doesn't change the molecule. Yeah, that confirms that it's neither cis nor trans. Oh, I forgot to do one thing. I decided to flip the ethyl and the hydrogen. You could have done the other one. You could have said, yeah, let's leave the ethyl pointing up and the hydrogen pointing on, down on the right side of the molecule, and then switch the methyl and the hydrogen. Hydrogen, you gotta go up and methyl go down. And now your identical groups are on opposite sides of the double bond. This is trans. And these two are actually the same. You'd have to build a model and kind of flip it like this, in order to get this one to look like that. Um, the double bond is trigonal planar. It's a flat triangle shape. This whole molecule is flat about the double bond. So it's just flat. So you can flip it like this, and then it'll look like this. So it depends on how you want to look at the molecule. These are, in fact, the same. OK, let's do this one. Um, draw a line through the double bond. Sure, I'm going to pick this alkene carbon and switch the two groups. So let's put the hydrogen up and the methyl down. Leave the other two alone. Ethyl is up, still up. Chlorine is down, still down. And then ask, are these different isomers? Yeah, they are. Here the methyl and the ethyl are cis to each other. Here the methyl and the ethyl are trans to each other. Um, but you can't say this is cis, because the definition, you see way at the top here, it's the identical groups that are adjacent or apart. So these methyl and ethyl groups are not identical. So you're forbidden from using cis in the name. Darn it. But they are isomers. This top molecule is different from that one. They're different from each other. So I just drew a little bit better down here. So what we do? Well, we do have isomers. And we have four different groups. That reminds me of chirality again. They're gonna need different names. But you can't use this in trans. We need something else. Wait, was there a little note down here? Yeah, a new prefix is required. Uh, but thankfully, it does remind us of chirality. So why don't we just adapt that old method for alkenes? So I imagine IUPAC went back to Con, Engel, and Pregalog and said, hey, you guys, you did that funny RNS thing with the four, you know, four groups on a chiral carbon. How'd that work again? And we got this problem with isomers of alkenes. Think we can tweak your rules to make it work? 
Sure, here's how it's done. Okay, so we need to call one of these cis and one of these trans, but that failed, right? Cis and trans relies on the two identical groups. We don't have identical groups. So when that happens, you're gonna have to go and use this new con angle prelog set of rules for alkenes. Okay, so how does that work? Well, step one, consider each alkene carbon separately. My method is, let's put a circle around one alkene and a square around another. Consider them separately. That's step one. Step two, for each alkene carbon, rank those two groups. Yeah, do you remember when we had our chirality center? And we say, oh yeah, this carbon's linked to four different groups. And then so let's find out if it's RS. We said, okay, use the periodic table. Well, there's one here on the right. Um, hydrogen has atomic number one. Fluorine, if you go on the right side, is atomic number nine. Yep, there it is. Fluorine's nine, chlorine's 17, bromine's 35. So bromine wins and gets first place. So bromine's ranked first based on atomic number. Chlorine, element 17. It's next highest. Fluorine's nine, so it gets third place. Sorry, hydrogen, you're going to lose this game. That was a chirality game, and then we did something to get RS. Okay, I just want to review the ranking, because you're going to do it again, but only on two groups. So look at the circled alkene. What are your two groups? What's the first atom? It's a carbon versus a hydrogen. Right, quick peek at the periodic table, carbon's element six, hydrogen's still element one, it's gonna lose. So between the hydrogen and methyl, the methyl, well, the carbon that is of methyl, gets first place, well, it just wins. It gets first place, hydrogen gets last. Okay, new game with the other alkene carbon, where your two groups, first atoms are carbon versus chlorine, Ooh, chlorine was element 17, carbon's element 6, chlorine won between these two groups. Okay, that's step two. Just rank the two groups independently, right? So one game with one alkene carbon, new game with the other alkene carbon. Then draw a line through your double bond and ask, how are those highest rank groups oriented? Well, here they're opposite. I have the isomer over here, so we'll quickly do it. Circle carbon, it was C versus H. C wins, element six. Try again. Uh, this carbon, the square carbon, is chlorine versus carbon. Chlorine's element 17 wins over element six. Here, the two are together on the same side. Think of it as the same side. because Kahn, Engel, Prelog were, they spoke German, and the German word for together is like Zusammen, it starts with a Z. So they said, okay, we're not gonna say cis because that word means two identical groups. Can't use the word cis here. So we're gonna use the German word for same or uh, together, and that's Zusammen with a Z. So this is the Z isomer. The two highest ranked groups are on the same side. Same side. Yeah, same side sounds funny, but it keeps reminding you of the Z. Over here, the German word for opposite is like Entgegen. It starts with an E. So this is the E isomer. Kind of looks trans, but trans means identical groups, opposite sides. We don't have identical groups. Can't use the word trans. We have to use the letter Z. That's an E. E for opposite. And so now in the name, instead of the word cis or trans, you would lead with E in parentheses and the rest of the name. And this one would be Z and the rest of the name. Oh, it won't take long. Let's just do it real quick. Where's the longest chain with the most important functional group? Five carbons long. Cool. Name? Uh, five carbons is pentane. But change the ane to an E. That was step two. Step three, number it. Well, number it so you can get to the alkene as fast as you can. I know there's a halide, but the dull bond outranks it. So 
first number of the chain to get to the double bond as fast as you can. That'd be on the left side. And hey, here's a case where the double bond didn't start the chain. I knew there was a case where that happened. The double bond shows up on carbon two. So, so far the name's two pentene. Any other branches? Yeah, on carbon three, there's a chloro group. So on carbon three, there's a chloro. And then the double bond is on carbon two. So whether you put the two next to the ene or the two in front of the parent, they both work. But the name of this isomer on the left is E, three chloro, two pentene. If you had more than one double bond in the chain, yeah, if they're cis and trans or E and Z, you need a label for each one. So you could put the number of the starting of the carbon, of the alkene, in front of the E. If you had more than one double bond and it was like, well, which one of these is E, which one is Z, put the number with the letter so you know which double bond has the E or Z configuration. There you go. And then here, it's okay to drop the two because what's the E referring to? Oh, the ene. And the ene is on two. So that's, this part is telling you where to, what the E is corresponding to. I'll try another one. Yeah, let's do a couple more. All right, crazy molecule again. This video is starting to get a little long. So I apologize, I'm not gonna give the full name. Let's just assign E or Z or neither. It's possible it doesn't have a cis or trans or an E or Z. Okay, so how do we figure that out? Well, go find the alkene, put a line through it. Let's test for cis and trans. On this alkene carbon, there's a three carbon group with bromine and there's a one carbon with the fluorine. On the other double bond, there's three carbons, no bromine, and four carbons, okay, we have four different groups again. It's not cis or trans. Can't use cis or trans identify. So then we have to use the conning and prelog rules. So starting on the circle group, hey, bromine beats fluorine, right? I can take your shortcut? Nope, not how the game's played. Sorry, foul, out of bounds. The game is played one atom at a time. So, hey, Alkene, what are you attached to? A C and a C, that's a tie. Okay, break the tie with these two carbons. Okay, carbon, what you holding? What's your poker hand? Um, I'm attached to this C over here, and I have two H's. So I, I'm carrying a C and two H's. All right, carbon, what are you holding? Well, I got two H's and a fluorine, ha! My high card's fluorine, yours is carbon. This side wins. This is the higher ranked, right? Um, value pack, sorry. Con Engel Prelog rule says just find the higher rank, the winning group. Sorry, Carbon, you get you don't get to play that bromine. It's too far away. It's not in your hand. Okay, so the higher rank group for the circle alkene is down below the double bond. New game with this alkene carbon. Okay, play this carbon against that carbon. It's a tie. This has an H, an H, and a C. This one has an H, an H, and a C. Darn it, dead tie. Okay, new poker game between this carbon and that carbon. What do you got, carbon? I got two H's and a C. What do you have, carbon? I got two H's and a C. Dang it, okay. New game between this carbon and this carbon. Hey, carbon up here at the end of the chain, what are you holding? Dang it, I only have three H's. Three of a kind, right? That's good, right? No, not in this game. Um, this carbon, you're holding a C. <laughs> That's going to beat all those H's. This group wins. So this group is above the double bond. This group's below. They're not on the same side. It's the E. Entgegen isomer. It's the E isomer. All right, new game. New alkene, draw a line through it. Um, look at this double bond, this carbon, this alkene versus this one. This alkene has a methyl and a hydrogen. This carbon, hey, it has a methyl and a chlorine. We have identical groups. Each alkene carbon has a methyl. You could just say, boom, this is cis, winner. You totally can't. The identical groups are on the same side above the alkene. 
So we're done, we can walk away. But if the question said, I need E or Z labels or neither, then you're not done. You can still use E and Z if you choose to, or if I ask you to on the exam. So new game, Alkin Carbon, what are you holding? I got a C and an H, the C wins. Other alkene carbon, what are you holding? I got a C and a chlorine. <clears throat> chlorine wins. Where are your two ice groups? They're not the same side. This is E. Ew. I thought cis meant same side. Well, you have to be careful with your definitions. Cis does mean same side, but identical groups, same side. Methyls are same side. E means opposite sides for not identical groups, opposite sides for highest rank groups, methyl versus chlorine are opposite. And just to keep us sane, <laughs> does it? We'll try. Uh, hey, is this E or Z? Oh, the circle carbon. You have a carbon versus a hydrogen, carbon wins. <clears throat> Other carbon, it's a C versus H, carbon wins. So the two highest rank groups are above, they're on the same side. The identical groups, you could say, hey, the identical groups are hydrogens. They're on the same side, too. They're cis. So just to review, these molecules are both cis, but the way the conangle prelog rules work, this one on the right is Z and cis. The other one is cis and E. It's all about the rules and how you play the game. Don't you just love organic chemistry? Yikes. Lots of details, right? So you got to do this in chunks. And I know this video is getting a little long, so you might want to pause it, come back later, do a few homework problems, and see if you can label things E and Z. And then separately do a few homework problems where you label things cis and trans, so you can get it straight. And if you're ready for a little bit more, we'll keep going. Next topic about alkenes. Well, <clears throat> little review here. Back in the alkane section, we talked about how if you had straight chains or branches of alkanes, they actually could contain the maximum number of hydrogens. They were saturated. Hydrocarbons contain the maximum number of hydrogens. And we had a neat little formula to predict how many hydrogens are there. If n is the number of carbons, if you let me use a hashtag for, hashtag for number sign, then take the number of carbons, multiply it by two, and add two more. That would be the maximum number of hydrogens. And that tells you how many hydrogens are on molecules called hydrocarbons when they're saturated. But there's other hydrocarbons, molecules with H's and C's, that are unsaturated. They don't have the maximum number. So that's something else going on. And it turns out alkenes are an example of unsaturated hydrocarbons. To make room for the double bond, the pi bond, you have to remove some hydrogens. Carbon can only make four bonds. So if you have a double bond present, it's unsaturated. Um, that's what this line says. Uns hydrocarbons can be unsaturated if they contain pi bonds. So a double bond, ooh, a triple bond has two pi bonds. So if a molecule has a triple bond, that makes it unsaturated also. It turns out the rings. To attach a chain end to end to form a ring, you have to pop off two hydrogens to make room to make that bond that makes the ring. So unsaturated alkanes, sorry, unsaturated hydrocarbons will contain rings and pi bonds. Back over here, saturated versus unsaturated. You may have heard of fats being saturated or unsaturated, and there are some health benefits and consequences to those food molecules dealing with saturated and unsaturated. So here, let's look at a nutrition label. And we got trans fats. So hopefully you know that trans fats are bad for you. Does a trans fat have a double bond in it? It sure does. So, so trans refers to alkenes. They also refer to rings. But, so I guess we had a 50-50 shot. Is trans fat, does it have a ring in it or something's trans or does it have an alkene, carbon carbon double bond? And it's a carbon carbon double bond. So trans fats, fat molecules, where somewhere in the molecule there's a double bond, carbon carbon double bond, and it's trans. Turns out that's not good for you. I'll explain why in a second. You may have heard, though, that the unsaturated fats, 
polyunsaturated and monounsaturated, they're healthier. Hmm, how many alkenes do you think is in a monounsaturated fat? Mono means one, right? Poly means many. So yeah, so a polyunsaturated fat would have two or more alkenes. Saturated fat, though, doesn't have any. It's maxed out on alkanes and hydrogens. So here's a portion of a fat molecule. The fat molecule is actually much bigger than this, at least three times bigger. So this is a portion of it. And there, in fat molecules, there's long, long chains. This one's saturated. Maximum number of hydrogens. More importantly, all alkanes. Alkanes are free to spin. So you can spin all these single bonds in one shape. A very stable shape is a straight chain. It's stable because if you draw Newman projections about every carbon, carbon carbon pair, they're all staggered. And, they're sta and actually, they're all anti. Ooh, that's the most stable shape. So if you have a straight chain, saturated, it prefers to be straight. That's its most stable shape. But if you have an unsaturated fat, this is a portion of a, of a fat molecule that has a, a, degree, has a, a double bond in it. Is this double bond cis or trans? Well, where are the identical groups? Well, this group right here has an atom that's different from this group. So this big long chain is different from that chain. So it's a hydrogen here. This hydrogen, that hydrogen, draw a line through the double bond. The both hydrogens are above. They're on the same side. This is cis. So when you have a fat molecule, big fat molecule. No, when you have a molecule that's called a fat, with a carbon-carbon double bond in it, nature likes to make them cis because it puts a kink in the chain. Because the two identical groups are together, the rest of the molecule has to be together, and it bends that chain. Why is that important? Well, if you have a nice straight molecule and you have a whole bunch of fat molecules that are straight, they can stack on one another really easily and three-dimensionally and they form a somewhat crystalline solid, very much like butter. You ever think about hard butter that rips up your toast? Yeah, think about that. Think about saturated fats hardening up like butter. Butter actually is made with a lot of saturated fat. But if you take olive oil, canola oil, avocado oil, whatever is your health, healthy oil, soybean oil, whatever, they contain a lot of unsaturation a lot of polyunsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats. They do contain some saturated fats. This is actually the label for olive oil. But it doesn't have the appearance of hard butter at room temperature. There is some saturated fat in there, two grams. But there's one gram of polyunsaturated and 10 grams of monounsaturated. So most of the fat molecules that make up olive oil have kinks in them. And so now all these molecules that are bent they're trying to stack on each other and stick together. And there's these big gaps where they're not in contact, not sticking. So they're the same type of molecule, but with kinks in them, they can only form liquids at room temperature. Olive oil versus butter. So now if you have a, a diet with high fat in it, you want to make sure you get the unsaturated fats. Because which of these two Saturated fats or unsaturated fats do you want flowing through your arteries? Want little chunks of butter or do you want little droplets of olive oil? Yeah, I mean, you shouldn't have, have well, there's some description. There. Yeah, there's some debate on what's healthy. Healthy fats are good in your diet, by my understanding. But the unsaturated ones, yeah, you, you might have little, you don't literally, literally have chunks of butter, no. However, the saturated fats do contribute to hardening of the arteries and those arterial plaques, kind of hard material, grime coating inside of arteries. And it's because those saturated fats find it easy to stack and crystallize and form, you know, little arterial plaques that are gonna harden and close up the arteries. So get more olive oil and canola oil and soybean oil in your diets, kind of minimize the saturated fats. That's a little healthy organic chemistry for you. That was all a diversion about saturated and unsaturated, but that was kind of cool. <laughs> Something else kind of cool, and I hope you appreciate this. This one actually is actually really cool. Okay. Saturated means molecules containing the maximum hydrogen. 
unsaturated, they have less than that. For every pi bond or a ring that the molecule has, they'll even have fewer hydrogens, right? Every time you have a pi bond, you have to take away two hydrogens and make that pi bond to make that double bond or the triple bond. And so we talk about how many rings and pi bonds they have, and we say the term is degrees of unsaturation. So there's a word out there, right? Every, scientists, every new idea gets a new label, a new term. So if we want to total up how many pi bonds and rings are in the molecule, how many degrees of unsaturation we have, that's what we say. It's a degree of unsaturation for this molecule. Doesn't have the maximum because there's some pi bonds and rings. Well, how many pi bonds and how many rings? Let's add them up. What's really cool is if you have the chemical formula, you can calculate it without drawing the molecule. Sweet. So I need you to memorize this equation. It's not too bad after you figure out what it's doing. So this will actually calculate for you the total number of pi bonds the total possible number of pi bonds and rings in a molecule based on the chemical formula. So this is how the, the equation works. Um, first figure out what's the maximum number of hydrogens if it's saturated. Well, that's 2n plus 2. So go get your chemical formula, see how many carbons there are. 2 times the number of carbons plus 2 more gives you the saturated number, the number of hydrogens if the molecule is saturated then every pi bond or ring is going to be less than that. So you can look at the number of hydrogens. Is it a match? Do you actually have the maximum number? <laughs> if so, it's saturated. But no, take the actual number of hydrogens from the chemical formula and then make some adjustments for other atoms in the, molecule, in the chemical formula. And then you take the number of saturated hydrogens that are theoretically possible, subtract your actual numbers after you make some adjustments, Divide that by two, why? Well, if you have an alkene and you have an alkane, how many hydrogens does the saturated one have? How many more does it have from the unsaturated? It has two more, right? So one degree of unsaturation, you have one pi bond, it's gonna take away two of the hydrogens. So that's why we're dividing by two. I'm hoping that if you understand where this equation is coming from, it'll help you remember it. And that is the equation that tells you how many total pi bonds and rings you have in a molecule. All right, let's talk about the adjustments and then we'll practice using the formula. Okay, um, there's some symmetry here. The most common elements in organic chemistry are H-O-N-C, honk. So we already know what to do in this equation for C's and H's. Um, we need to know how many C's there are so we can calculate 2N plus 2. We need to know how many hydrogens are in our molecule because we're going to put it here, the actual number of hydrogens. And then look at your O's and, and N's. Oh, but H also stands for halides. Halides like to make one bond. OK. Wait, halides like to make one bond? Hydrogen makes one bond. So if your molecule has a halide in it, it's taking the spot that a hydrogen used to occupy. So count the halides like as if they were hydrogen when you're trying to find out how many pi bonds and rings are here. So count like hydrogen. Um, and the tip is halide and hydrogen both start with H. So we're, we're taking the total number of hydrogens we're adding them up in the molecule. So add in the halides. Halides count as hydrogen. Oxygen looks like the letter zero. Letter. Looks like the number zero. Um, so you ignore the oxygen. And that's because if we start with the saturated hydrocarbon, ethane, and we stick in an oxygen, it's still saturated. It didn't take away the H's didn't add more H's by inserting the O, the oxygen atoms won't affect the degree of unsaturation. So just ignore them, or technically you're gonna, they, they equal zero. So add in the zero for how many oxygens. Yeah, just ignore the oxygens. Nitrogen is negative. So nitrogen makes three bonds. So we take ethane and we set, insert a nitrogen. Nitrogen's usually making three bonds, so it needs another hydrogen for the third bond. 
it's going to bring in an extra hydrogen. And if you have two carbons, 2n plus 2 gives you 6, right? Two carbons, 2 plus 2. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 2 more is 6. 6 is saturated. Hey, this molecule has 7. That's that super saturated? No, no, no. Nitrogen brought in its own. So we need to take that out to see that there's actually six hydrogens. Oh yeah, this molecule is saturated. It's got the maximum of six. So every time a nitrogen atom shows up in your chemical formula, you need to subtract one. And that sounds like negative one. So if you have nitrogen, remind yourself, take away a hydrogen. And I had a student a few years back say, I just remember halides count as hydrogen, but not nitrogen. I subtract the nitrogen. Let's try it. Okay. Um, this is how it might show up on an exam. I won't say give me degrees of unsaturation. I'm going to say apply your knowledge of degrees of unsaturation by quickly drawing two isomers, at least two, for each chemical formula. Okay, so let's try the first one. How many degrees are here? Well, if it was saturated, it would have two times n, or two times four, plus two more. Uh, two times four is eight, plus two is 10. Quick check, nope, doesn't have 10, it's not saturated. The rest of the equation is subtract the actual number, eight, and then factor any adjustments. There's no O's or halides or anything else here, so just ignore that. The adjustments aren't necessary. So we're just going to subtract the actual number of hydrogens and then we divide the whole thing by two. So the degrees are, do the math, two times four is eight plus two is ten minus eight all divided by two. Well ten minus eight is two divided by two <laughs> is one. There is one degree so the, the sum of pi bonds and rings is one. So that our molecule has one pi bond or has one ring. Okay, so now to draw, quickly draw an isomer of C4H8, we need two of them actually, decide if you wanna put in a pi bond or a ring. Well, let's try a pi bond. So let's draw four carbons in a row. And I'll put a pipe on there. Done. Magically, this will contain eight hydrogens. We can check. Carbon bonds four times. So if we're drawing, this carbon only has two lines to it, so there's two hydrogens. Put another hydrogen here. This carbon has two lines, so there's two H's. This carbon is a methyl, three H's. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Beautiful. So you don't have to do that unless you have extra time on the exam you want to check. Otherwise, C4H8, well, I'm going to draw another chain of four, throw in a pi bond here. And that, I got one degree in my molecule. I got C4. Magically, the eights, sorry, magically the hydrogens will equal eight. And if you want a third isomer, this is trans. The methyls are on opposite sides. So you could draw this for a third isomer. If I said, hey, draw as many isomers as you can, well then maybe you don't want a straight chain, maybe you want a branch chain, and then throw in a pi bond. Great, we got four isomers. And then maybe you're getting tired of pi bond, so try a ring. Well, a ring of four gives you cyclobutane. That does have eight hydrogens. Don't like squares? Try a triangle. There's three carbons with a methyl branch. There's one ring, one ring, that's one degree of unsaturation. There's a total of four carbons in these. These are all isomers. Nice, nice and fast way to draw isomers. Cool. All right, um, what else we got? We got C10, H18. So the formula is two times 10, well, degrees, calculate the degrees, two times 10 plus two more minus the actual number 18, and then any adjustments, nope, no other elements present. 
divide the whole thing by two. Degrees equals, sorry, two times 10 is 20, plus two is 22, minus 18 divided by two. 22 minus 18 is four divided by two. Okay, we have two degrees. So we have two pi bonds. We have two rings or we have one pi bond and one ring. Okay, so we only needed two isomers, but we have three possibilities. So we can go crazy on the isomers now. Um, let's think about two pi bonds. Well, put 10 in a row. You could have branches also. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You could put a pi bond here and a pi bond there. You can make a triple bond. That's two pi bonds. You can also make branches, whatever you want to do. Please avoid putting double bonds side by side. Back in, uh, I forget where it was, when we're talking about hybridization, I believe. Um, nature doesn't like that. She likes to alternate double bonds or maybe spread them out. So. Anyways, it's unlikely the molecule would have one carbon involved in two double bonds. Just a little advice. If you drew it on exam, I would give you full credit, but I'd cringe. It's like, yeah, it's probably not going to happen. Um, two rings. Well, there's 10 carbons, so why don't we make two pentagons? There's 10 carbons and just link them together. Or do you like hexagons? There's six carbons. There's four carbons, link them together. <laughs> you got two, okay, we got four isomers really quickly. And I just trust it must, these must all have 18 hydrogens. You can also have one, one pi bond, one ring. So I don't know, do you wanna do a ring of six? Nature likes six. And then give me four more. So one, two, three, four. And then I'll put the pi bond out here. No, I wanna put it here. How about right here? Lots of choices, lots of isomers. Um, what else we got? I think we have two more cases. C8H10. I need more room. C8H10. Well, how many hydrogens if it's saturated? Two times eight, plus eight plus two more. Minus 10. Yeah, there's no other elements present. Divide by two. Let's see, two times eight is 16, plus two is 18, minus 10, divided by two, that's eight divided by two, that is four, four degrees. Ooh, lots of possibilities, right? So we have four pi bonds. We have four rings. Or we could have three pi and one ring. Or we could have three rings and one pi. We could have two pi bonds and two rings. That get all every combination of how you can add up to four. I think so. <laughs> and now I'll just start drawing. However, we're going to use this degrees of saturation next semester. Next semester? Later this semester. We're going to get some experimental data, and we'll get a chemical formula. And we're going to have to try and figure out what does the molecule actually look like. Well, if you just take the formula, you can make some educated guesses, right? You can quickly draw molecules of four pi bonds or four rings or all these other combinations, draw lots and lots of guesses, and then you can look at the experimental data and narrow it down. But you can also narrow it down a little more, fat, a little more quickly than that. Nature has a functional group that does this, and it's one of her favorites. It's the arene functional group. So, the arene or aromatic compound or benzene. Take a ring, so there's one ring, and then add one, two, three double bonds that alternate, and that makes a brand new functional group, the arene functional group. So anytime, here's just, just some advice. Anytime you have four or more degrees, nature's probably gonna make the molecule with a arene functional group in there somewhere. And so definitely consider that as a possible isomer.
Okay. Um, the formula though was C8H10 and the arene only has six carbons. So maybe do you want an ethyl branch off of that? Or do you want a pair of methyls? Do you want one up on top or on the bottom? Remember the shortcut for the arene? You could put a circle there. Maybe you want the two methyls side by side. Um, all right, I already got three isomers and there's so many more possible ways you can draw it. You could keep going, but the question only asks for two. So we've got some extras, that's okay. Last one I want to do with this is C6H11. It's right down here. C6H11, Cl2, and an O. All right, yeah, I want to get some adjustments in here. Okay, Is that more room to my right? I do. Okay. So let's draw some isomers of this molecule. Okay, what are the degrees of unsaturation? Two times six plus two more gives me the number of saturated hydrogens. Subtract the actual number, there's actually 11. Okay, and then there's a halide. Yeah, chlorine, but it's a halide that sounds like hydrogen, starts with hydrogen. You count it like hydrogen. How many halides are there? two of them. So we actually have 11 hydrogens, but you could pretend you have 13. Hydrogen, the halides count like, like hydrogen. Ooh, but not nitrogen. Nope. Every nitrogen, you subtract one. There's one nitrogen in the formula, so I subtract one. If there are five ends here, yes, subtract five. Oxygen looks like the number zero, so just ignore it. We made our adjustments. Divide the whole thing by two. Let's see, two times six is 12, plus two is 14. 11 plus two is 13, minus one is 12. Divide by two, 14 minus 12 is two, two divided by two is one, we have one degree. So either one ring or one pi bond. Your choice. Oh wait. How about we do one of each, <laughs> since we need two isomers. So um, let's do a chain of six. You decide if you want to branch it or straight chain it. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's got one degree of unsaturation, so maybe I'll make a carbon-carbon double bond here at the beginning. What other decorations do I need? I need two chlorines. Well, put them somewhere here. Want to put this on the same carbon? You can. Put on the next one, just because that's a possibility too. There's also an N here, so let's put an N on there. Be a little careful. Is this a good skeletal drawing? No. For the C's that have H's, you can leave off the hydrogens. But all other elements, you must list the number of hydrogens they are attached to. And if you don't remember, honk's a good way to remember. Nitrogen needs three bonds. It's got one bond here. So they make three, it needs two more H's. And the formula is also an O. Now you wanna put the end. If you do, don't change this carbon into an oxygen, right? Make another bond and attach the O. How many bonds does oxygen make? Two. So that forces me to put another hydrogen here. Okay, so there's one isomer. We wanna check and see if we have 11 hydrogens. Well. Carbon bonds four times, so it's missing one bond here. It's got all four there. Ooh, it's missing a bond here. Nitrogen's good. Carbon's missing two bonds, so two H's. This carbon missing two bonds, two H's. This carbon's missing two bonds, two H's. All right, so then we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yay! Thank you, degrees. So you didn't have to do that. That's a nice check. We needed two isomers. We just did one with a pi bond, but just want to show you, why do you have to have the double bond between two carbons? There are more functional groups for the double bond between the oxygens. So you can make an aldehyde here or move the oxygen in the middle chain, put a double bond on it, make it a ketone. Put it next to the nitrogen, make it an amide. Put it next to the chlorine, make it an acid chloride. Okay, so more possibilities. Um, you know what, I'm, I feel so motivated. Let's make 
the oxygen and ketone. So six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'll put the ketone there. I've used up my pi bond. So now just add the other decorations. Um, I'll put both chlorines here. And I still have a nitrogen, so maybe I'll stick it here. And I need H2. The oxygen and nitrogen could be part of the chain. That's another isomer. How about a ring? Well, how about, well, the C6, so why don't we do a hexagon? And there we go, cyclohexane. I've used up my degree. I did the ring already. So now I add two chlorines. They could be on the same carbon. They could be on opposite ones. They could be around the ring wherever. Put on an O and an N, wherever you want. You put the N in the chain. That's legal. Just make sure your N's and O's are making, are doing honk correctly. Make sure they have their hydrogens and the correct number of bonds. There you go. So this should magically have 11 hydrogens. I trust that it does. You can check, you can pause it and check if you like. I'm going to move on to last topic, question mark. I think so. Let me zoom out, just double check. Yay! Last topic. I know, it's been a long video. Thank you for sticking with me. But the last topic about alkenes, before we move on and start doing reactions, is that alkenes like to have groups. They don't like to be just kind of naked and out there. So the more stable the alkene is, sorry, I'm saying that incorrectly, the more groups on the alkene, the more stable it becomes. So the least stable alkene is ethylene, common name, or ethene, iupacnate. This is the least stable because the alkene has four hydrogens. Hydrogen is pretty small. Turns out alkenes are quite reactive because of the pi bond. So this is really reactive because these hydrogens are not like blocking other groups, protecting it. Now, when I say blocking it, it's not exactly accurate. What's the shape of the alkene trigonal planar? It's a flat triangle. So reagents can come and sit down on this pi bond or come in from the bottom quite easily. But if you start putting other groups, like if you say, hey, what if I take out this hydrogen and put on a butyl group? That adds some stability. It adds some crowding to it, kind of starts blocking the alkene from other reagents. More importantly, um, does something called hyperconjugation. We'll get into that later. Um, but the other additional carbons, they possess electrons and they can help feed those electrons into the pi bond and make it a little more stable. And that's one group helping to stabilize it. What if you added two? So let's take off this one. So the two remaining hydrogens are cis, and we'll put maybe a methyl group here. You put anything on here. And now the alkene with two groups on it, it's di-substituted, right? Originally there was four H's, but we substituted out the H's for groups. This alkene has two groups on it. It's di-substituted. But this group and that group are crowding each other out. It's better for them to go trans. So on the alkene, I got two groups. This is still di-substituted, but it's trans, and there's more room. It's more stable. It's a little hard to see why. Well, you can talk to me after class if you like. Um, if you have two groups on the same alkene carbon, that's neither cis nor trans, right? How do you make the isomer? Um, move the methyl down here and put the hydrogen up there, and now the identical groups are side by side. That makes it cis. You change this H with that H, it doesn't change the molecule. Same thing, it's neither cis nor trans. And it turns out that's about the same stability as trans. These two groups are not really crowding each other out that badly. Three groups is better than two. So what I like to do is circle the alkene, and as I circle it, I cut through this bond, I cut through that bond, I, hydrogen doesn't count. I cut through this bond, I cut through three bonds, that helps me identify there's three groups on this double bond. Try substitute, ooh, that's pretty good, that's nice and stable. But if you circle this one, I cut through this bond, cut through this one, cut through this one, cut through that one, I cut four bonds as I circle the alkene, that's tetra substitute, and that's the best. That's the most stable. 
we need to memorize this trend. More groups on alkene, more stable, because in a chemical reaction, if you're going to make an alkene, which one do you think nature wants to make? She can be kind of lazy, she's gonna try and make the most stable ones. So if it's, po if it's possible that she could create all these possible alkenes, She's gonna make most of them the tetra substituted. That will be your major product. So this is, this is a powerful trend we need to use to predict products. So for now, just know more groups on alkene, it's more stable. And to break the tie between the disubstituted ones, cis is more crowded than trans or neither. Cis is less stable. Thanks for staying around. I'll see you in the next video.